evening. Welcome to Dawson Community College. Thanks for coming out tonight for our second lecture in our guest lecture series, Montana and the 1918 Influenza Pandemic by Janelle M. Olberding. Janelle is the Marketing and Public Relations Director at DCC. She's also an adjunct instructor for us. She is currently teaching uh, Native American studies for us, uh, that, that class, uh, giving the background history of Native Americans in Montana. And then she's also connecting with uh, different tribes and, and leaders around the state to bring in the current culture on Native American studies. Her research focusing on Butte, Montana, extraordinarily high mortality rate during the 1918 influenza pandemic has appeared in the Journal of the West. And she also has a book, Butte and the 1918 Influa Pandemic, it's scheduled for release in May of 2019. <coughs> the upcoming guest lecture series that we invite you to on Monday, March 25th is opening of the Native Voices. So Janelle has worked on this with Jennifer Wheeler, our art instructor here. They are currently taking entry forms to do an art exhibit, a Native American art exhibit. This, this guest lecture series will take place in the library, actually. We're in the process of creating a um, gallery space in the library. So that'll, this will be the first exhibit that will be well, here in our exhibit space. On Tuesday, April 9th, we'll have Mark Johnson back. He will be doing Jewish resistance during the Holocaust, and he was also our first guest lecturer when we had um, our, the, the Chinese culture in Montana last month. We, we will be looking to continue this throughout the summer, so we'll try to get somebody here May, June, July, August. So if you are interested in doing a guest lecture on some research or uh, something interesting, please let Janelle know. We can add that to our lineup. And I'd like to introduce Janelle. All right, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I know it's cold and snowy out, so I appreciate that. Um, I am going to talk about uh, Montana and the pandemic in 1918, and I know Butte was mentioned a lot in that introduction that, sorry, I'm not used to holding this while I talk, so keep reminding me if I drop it. Um, but I did try to add some local color to this for this evening to kind of localize it and give you all a little more information about uh, the pandemic experience here in Dawson County. I always like to start this, though, um, talking about how I got into this research, this handsome young fellow is my paternal grandfather, uh, Benjamin Schelkemeyer. He was born in March of 1918, you'll see, uh, the youngest of four, and the only child of immigrants from South Russia, what is now Ukraine, came to the United States. And why I bring this up is because uh, my grandfather's father, so my great-grandfather, his name is Kristoff, and our family kind of history talks about how he was a very kind and compassionate individual and helped out his neighbors when they started to fall ill later in the fall of 1918. And in November of 1918, unfortunately, he ended up dying of influenza. So I bring this up because I think, so you'll see my grandfather kind of made his way west, married my grandmother, had my dad. My dad would really appreciate this photo of young Fred up on here. But I bring this up because it's not only how I got into this topic, but because I think all of us, whether we have um, an influenza victim or a survivor in our family history, can relate somehow to this idea of a legacy being left by the pandemic. And I'll talk about that a little bit more as we get on. So first, just a little background information. Does, has anyone kind of know anything at all about the pandemic of 1918? A few? Okay. So, good. So, um, it actually came, there was about three waves of the pandemic. It started in early spring of 1918, and it was kind of mild so much that people didn't really realize fully that they were dealing with what would become a pandemic. 
took a little break in the summer, and then it really hit hard. Influenza hit all across the globe really hard. And the autumn, and it started in about late August and September in 1918, and going on throughout the winter into about January, February, before making this comeback in the spring of 1919, around May, June time frame, give or take a bit. Okay, I'll get it better eventually. Hang on. There we go. All right, so even now, 100 years later, researchers are still debating where this all started. Um, a lot of people say it began in East Asia, where most of these pandemics start, where humans and livestock live in very close quarters sometimes. Um, others say it started in France, because that was really where it was first documented, was in the troops in France. But I think one of the most prevalent theories is that it started in, in rural Kansas, actually, in January of 1918, where some farm boys uh, were out and working, feeding the cows, feeding the hogs, because that's one of the reservoirs, and then got sick and carried that back to the army camps where it spread and made its way around the globe. There we go. All right. Thank you. In total, so 50 million plus deaths worldwide in that year time frame, and 675,000 in the United States. So this memorial is in Barry, Vermont, and it says, if you, it might be a little hard to read, but it killed more Americans than all the combat war deaths in the 20th century combined. So, and if we think about it, it was during that autumn and winter of 1918-19 where it was really the most deadly and hit the most people. So it was really most of those deaths happened within a six month time frame, if you think about that. My next bullet point says about 5,000 deaths in Montana, and that was definitely all within that six month time frame. And so 5,000 people in Montana at that point is about 1% of the population. So if we think about it in those terms, that's one out of every 100 people dying of influenza in Montana in less than six months. So the city of Butte actually, though holding about 10% of the state's population at that time, was responsible for about a third a few, of those deaths. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Let's talk about influenza. What are some, let's do some interaction here, so you don't have to listen to me the entire time. Symptoms of influenza. If you've ever had the flu, you know it, because it's nothing to joke around with, even seasonal. Oh, no. There it is. Okay. So what happens? If you get the flu, what's the first thing you feel? <laughs> you feel terrible. You have a fever. You have usually a very high fever. It gets. Another thing is that I've been misfortunate enough to have the flu a couple of times, and the first thing that I always realized when I probably had the flu is that I just hurt. My entire body ached. I felt like I couldn't move, and I was just exhausted. There's one other kind of hallmark sign that goes along with that. A cough. Usually a dry one. They're usually unproductive. So, exhaustion, your body aches, you get chills, fever up to 104, usually dry cough. So the virus of 1918 had all of those symptoms, but they were a little bit different at times. So there was exhaustion, you were exhausted. But at the same time, victims would have a lot of trouble sleeping because I was, there we go. They had these extreme body aches. A lot of people compared it to the way you get the victims of malaria would get body aches, and malaria is also known as bone break fever. So that's kind of exemplary about just how painful this was. 
So chills. Fever up to and above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. And 104 is usually that run to the doctor immediately kind of thing. And then the cough, it started dry, but in a lot of cases, especially the more severe ones, it really became productive and produced this horrible, like, bloody sputum and was probably horrific to not only experience, but to try to care for someone that had that symptom. The other thing, too, that was just terrifying to me is this, is this thing called cyanosis. And this is when you, your, the oxygen doesn't flow very well through your body. So the tips of your fingers and your nose and your ears will start to turn blue and purple because they're not getting enough oxygen to these extreme parts of your body. And doctors usually saw this as a sign that this person probably was not going to make it very much longer. They probably only had moments left. And then the other terrifying thing is just how quickly this disease progressed. So a hospital administrator up in Glasgow actually wrote that some persons hardly know they're sick until they're dying. And a professor and epidemiologist at Yale wrote that they had, they had a number of cases where people were perfectly healthy and then died within 12 hours. And on the very sudden, the patient sometimes passing from an apparently well conditioned to almost prostrate within one or two hours. And I've read other anecdotes, one from Philadelphia, um, where a gentleman got on the streetcar to go home after work, seemingly healthy and well, and didn't get off the streetcar because he had died en route to his home. So it just happened so suddenly. There were some risk factors which makes this particular influenza virus stand out, this particular strain stand out a little bit. So the people most at risk for this were folks between the ages of 20 and 44. So if you know anything about influenza, is that a normal thing? It's definitely not. It's completely op opposite of what we normally expect. Was doing so well. Uh, males were more su susceptible to this particular strain. And also, immigrants, folks that were not born within the United States but had immigrated, especially within the 20 years previous, died at higher rates. So, example of this is the popular employee of the Davis Daily Company. So Chris Vigias, age 38, boss broken at the Colorado mine of the Davis Daily Copper Company, an employee for the past five years, died yesterday of the flu at his home on South Dakota. This is from the Butte Miner. He leaves a wife and one child. He'd been a resident of Butte for 10 years and he was regarded very highly by his employers, popular among his associates, to whom the news of his sudden death came as a shock. Mr. Vigias was sick only five or six days, and he was of splendid physique, is how this whole thing ends. Is that he was perfectly healthy, and it took everyone completely by surprise when he died. It resonated in Butte for 10 years, because before that, he lived in Norway. He and his wife had immigrated from Norway. And the other thing this article doesn't mention, which is fair, because it's a couple days before it happened, is that his wife, who was just a few years younger than he was, died of influenza as well on the day that he was buried. So if we take a closer look at age, this is what we call a mortality curve. And so excess deaths are kind of charted by age to kind of show the breakdown. Uh, this is from an influenza pandemic in 1968. So we can see it follows what this, the mortality curve for typical seasonal influenza does with infants and children having higher rates, especially infants, higher mortality rates, and that kind of dropping off, and then starting to rise in middle adulthood, and then kind of shoot up as the older patients get, simply because the virus overwhelms immune systems. And there's also a lot of times a lot of other coexisting factors. In 1918, though, we have a completely different story with this. So we do have high mortality rates in infants, and then it drops off in childhood and adolescence, and then shoots up quite a bit 
in the middle age before dropping off. And look how opposite this is, is that older patients actually really didn't, weren't that susceptible at all to this particular strain of influenza for reasons that I will get to. There, I did say something. So, this shows the mortality curves for both the city of Butte and for Dawson County. So we need to remember that at this time, Dawson County geographically was much larger than it is now. It was most of eastern Montana. But at about this time, there were still about 12,000 people in Dawson County population-wise. So we're dealing with a very spread out, very rural population, even more so than we are today. So you'll see these mortality curves from Butte and from Dawson County match the pattern that was set internet, nationally and internationally with this particular virus, strain of the virus, I should say. One thing I do want to point out is right here, Dawson County had five infants in the, in the notices that died of influenza, whereas the city of Butte had 10 total. More than double the population, but we don't see that number of young children suffering like that. Of course, some probably went unreported. But I just want to point that out because I think those anomalies are really interesting things to think about. But, here's where I need my notes because there's lots of statistics that I don't normally know. All right. One of the reasons for this, this, this weird age yeah, in this weird mortality curve, is this condition called acute respiratory distress syndrome. What happens when someone gets ARDS is that our lungs try so hard and struggle so much to work, they end up being filled, the little sacs inside the lungs get filled with fluid, usually from some kind of infection, pneumonia, this happens sometimes. And this happened in a lot of these cases where folks, especially young people, died of this influenza in 1918. As that at autopsy, doctors would open them up and see that they had essentially drowned because their lungs were so heavy and so full of fluid. So a lot of doctors think this is what ended up happening. And the reason that this was most prevalent in young people of middle age or in otherwise prime health is that because their immune systems overreacted to this virus. It responded in such a quick and such a strong fashion that those immune proteins ended up overwhelming their lungs and, and filling them with fluid, causing this to happen. So it's really this kind of like tragic irony that the very thing that was supposed to protect these young, healthy people actually ended up killing them. The other reason that young people seem to be more susceptible, that's been speculated that young people were more susceptible, is because there was an influenza pandemic in 1892, not a pandemic, an epidemic, excuse me, in 1892, that was just in the United States, but people that were old enough to have been alive in those areas had some immunity to this virus in 1918, because scientists later discovered they had those viruses were somewhat similar. Similar enough that if someone in 1892 had come down with the strain of the flu, they already had some susceptibility in 1918. So older adults and people born in the United States, which is our first reason for why birthplace made such a difference in susceptibility. So they had, native born Americans had this acquired immunity. The other thing that was working against some immigrant groups was a lack of exposure to disease, just overall in general. So one of the interesting things that I noticed as I was looking through um, the records, especially for the city of Butte and what happened, is that there was a big discrepancy in the different immigrant populations and how susceptible they were. It seemed that immigrants from England and Ireland had higher survival rates. They didn't have as high mortality rates as immigrants from places in Northern Europe, 
Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, basically anywhere else in Europe. And the only thing that I can figure, especially if we're looking at Butte and the city and its industrialization, is that most of the immigrants from England and Ireland had come from places with similar environments to that city, from crowded living conditions, from cities with already a lot of dust and smoke, rather than like the forests of Scandinavia or the farmlands in Germany and Bohemia and places like that. And then I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about some cultural factors and barriers. So just unfamiliarity in general with American healthcare and public health practices, language barriers and belief systems that kind of maybe played a role in people not seeking care or not getting care, even if it was sought. So I have another example to pull from this. Uh, Suspiro, they misspelled his name, unfortunately, in the newspaper. Uh, Vicinich of the firm Vicinich and uh, Anglish, which is well known, East Park Street Business, died at his residence yesterday morning of influenza with pneumonia complications, 44 years of age and had been a resident of Butte for 19 years. He was born in Serbia, leaves a wife and two sons and a daughter. Another child was buried a week ago, a victim of influenza. So the child that they buried was, I think, less than two, I can't remember if he had turned one yet. And what this also leaves out is that uh, Mr. Gusinich's wife died just a few days after he did as well. So if we look though, he fits in that susceptible age bracket, an immigrant, and he was male. So if you look at those numbers though, they're really telling. So especially if we look at the city of Butte, you'll see that the number of deaths between American born citizens and immigrants, whether they've been naturalized or not, was about equal. However, their numbers, total population, are not equal whatsoever. Those ratios just don't match. So we can definitely see that there's this huge discrepancy here as far as the mortality rate. We take a look at Dawson County, so again, this is where I need my notes to make sure I'm saying this correctly. So Dawson County, two times more about double the number of deaths in native-born Americans rather than immigrants. The population of native-born Americans was about three to one to the immigrant population, a little more than three to one. So again, we have these ratios that really just don't, they don't quite match up. We still have this very susceptible population. And if we think about the immigrant groups that populated early Dawson County, they're from those areas of Northern Europe and Eastern Europe where we have more people that are susceptible, that become susceptible to this strain of the virus. And I just bring this up to point out, especially in Butte, we have this huge discrepancy. I know this chart might be kind of hard to read. But, so, uh, if we just look at the percentage lines, our male mortality rate is 2.3%. So 2.3% of all males living in Butte, Montana in the fall of 1918 died of influenza. Two point, that's two, a little over two out of every 100. And just 1.1 females. Those rates, it's almost double the female rate. The rates in Dawson County are a little, a little more equal. We don't really see that discrepancy here. But one of the things that I do want to point out is that women, pregnant women, were very, very susceptible to this. And I found in just the 70 or so death certificates recorded during this time in Dawson County, I found a lot of really sad examples of just how susceptible pregnant women were to this. Whoops, wrong one. So, we see, whoops. I 
got too excited and got ahead of myself and now I want to back up. There we go. If you press it enough times, it'll listen to you. So the first two I wanted to show you, so little lesson in reading death certificates, circa 1918. This is just the bottom quarter of each one. I didn't include the whole one just because I, I don't know, I just didn't. Just the three people's names on them. So um, even though it's public record now. But both of these list cause of death, so bronchial pneumonia, following influenza, and a contributing factor of pregnancy and confinement. Which in my mind, if someone's confined, under confinement when they're pregnant, it's already a complicated pregnancy and they already have some health concerns. So this poor woman was, was already, probably had a weak immune system and weak, and the virus, she just couldn't handle it. And then this other one, bronchial pneumonia and a miscarriage at six months, so six months pregnant and uh, miscarried. Contributing with the grip, which is this nice old-fashioned term for influenza that you see quite frequently on these. Going to the next one, this is the death certificate from for a stillborn infant, but seven months, where we see mother had influenza. And then the next one, here's mother's. Influenza contributory pregnant at seven months. So again, just a factor that made these women even weaker and more susceptible. The other thing, um, is this mother, or mother, infant. The mother's death certificate says she's widowed because her husband had died of influenza just a few days prior. So if we get though into the reason for, because in Montana had one of the four highest mortality rates out of all states in the US during this pandemic. Four out of the 50 states. So, there's some reasons for this though. Yes, butte contributes big time to this overall mortality rate, but Montana has a lot of, the whole state has a lot of contributing, like common demographics. So if we think about Montana in the early 20th century, the early 20th century, it's predominantly male. Young men are populating Montana at this time. So 60% of the state's population is male. Of these, I think at least half were between the ages of 20 and 44. So at least half of these, these men are in that susceptible age bracket. Yep, 30, I was off, 33%. And 24% of all of, the, all of the state's residents during that time had been born overseas, 24%. So one out of four of every resident had been born overseas. So with all of this combined, we see that that kind of makes Montana, this population was just kind of, to no way to put it better, kind of built to, to be susceptible to this strain of influenza. So I didn't say before, but you can feel free to interrupt me with questions at any time because I know that I get a little over, I've done this, talked about this a lot, I get overexcited and go kind of fast. So if you have questions, please just let me know and stop me. So I want to move on though because we could talk a lot about exactly what went on in Butte and in Dawson County uh, during these six months, but I wanted to kind of move on and talk about what happened afterwards. Because that's where I want to get is that legacy part. What happened afterwards is really in some ways just as important as what happened during those six months. So the pandemic had all of these lasting effects. Economically, we see, we see increased wages due to labor shortages because we've got the primary breadwinners a lot of times in families dying and we need to fill those jobs. So the cities with higher mortality rates especially, common sense kind of, experienced the highest increase in wages after this happened. So there's this little economic boom for a while as far as people are considered, as far as it's considered with people getting paid. Okay. And then, 
sickness. Increased poverty among individuals and families, though. So a lot of people, yes, did make more money, but if you're one of those families that loses your primary breadwinner, you don't, you move into poverty. So it's estimated that for every one person that died of influenza, four moved into poverty. So father, mother, two children, father dies. No, father, mother, three children, pardon my math. Father dies, the rest of the family moves into poverty because they've lost their primary breadwinner. Uh, insurance companies in the months after this paid out about $100 million in life insurance policy, which in today's money is about $20 billion paid out in life insurance money. But if we're thinking about maybe who could afford life insurance policies at that time, it's usually not the people that are at risk of moving into poverty if they lose their primary breadwinner. They can already afford that policy. They can maybe afford to help themselves, be able to help themselves a little bit more afterwards. We see this change in life expectancy. After the pandemic and all the young people dying so much, we have a life expectancy change of about 12 years. It was lowered by 12 years, overall life expectancy was. And then these effects on unborn children. So children specifically who'd been in utero while their mothers had influenza. Mother survived, still gave birth, baby was okay. But there's these long-lasting effects for these children. So high rates of miscarriage, we talked about that. There we go. All right, so the stress on the fetus, fetal stress really influenced health outcomes. So this photo is from the National Archives. It was taken during in processing at, a, at an army post during World War II, because this is the generation who's, who was born during the pandemic. They're now old enough to enlist or to be drafted. So um, as they're going through the enlistment or draftee process to get ready to go overseas, what was starting to be noticed as the, these children whose mothers had survived influenza while they were in utero were physically smaller than their counterparts. Then it was discovered later in life that they also had higher rates of disability, higher rates of incarceration, and chronic higher rates of chronic health problems as well. So these are really long-lasting effects that way. Mental health effects. So their survivors had higher rates of chronic fatigue syndrome and melancholia, which we would call depression, which I think is quite understandable in these cases. And then we have all these orphans of this lost generation. So by mid-November of 1918, the city of Butte was taking care of 50 children because they would lost both of their parents, one, usually both of their parents the pandemic. I think that's probably a very low estimate because it doesn't include all of the children like the two of the gentlemen I mentioned earlier who also lost both of their parents and were taken in by family or someone else. The pandemic also had a lot of major political implications. So a lot of people credit it for bringing about the end of World War I a lot quicker than it might have otherwise done. So Eric Ludendorff, who was the commander of German forces, kind of blamed, the pan blamed influenza on Germany's failed offensive in the spring of 1918. So we were sick, we couldn't do it, then our supply chains were disrupted, and we just never got, we never got our footing back under us. So it, I don't know if influenza picked a victor in the war, but it certainly brought it, probably bought, brought about the end quicker because both sides were afflicted. Both sides had a lot of soldiers get sick and a lot of soldiers die. So I think the end of that war came around a lot faster than it otherwise would have. When Woodrow Wilson was at Versailles to sign the treaty at the end of the war, he went in with this idea to kind of go a little softer on Germany as far as reparations go. He didn't feel like he wanted to be as harsh as Britain and France. Well, if we think about how hard 
Britain and France were hit during that war and how much those countries suffered compared to the United States. That maybe makes a little bit of sense. But Woodrow Wilson got sick with influenza when he was in Paris and recovered, but came out of his convalescence with that just kind of, in, his aides kind of said impatient and cranky, you know, to put it lightly. And he ended up capitulating to Britain and France and what they wanted to write in this agreement. And so Germany got these super harsh reparations following the war. It plunged that country into poverty and they were looking, you know, trying to find a way to recover. And in consequence, we get World War II, possibly. So there's this little connection there that some people think, you know, if President Wilson hadn't gotten sick in Paris, this whole mess maybe could have been avoided or at least played out a little bit differently. Then we have the appointment of Joseph Stalin. Uh, the man, I can't remember his name now, but he was Lenin's right-hand man at the time, got sick with the flu in the spring of 1919 and died. And eventually, Joseph Stalin came in and filled this power vacuum. So, and then we move on. And then finally, it, the pandemic was kind of the beginning of the end for a lot of modern colonial structures. So in New Zealand and Korea and Egypt, especially, it wasn't long after that before the natives of those countries really started to throw off their colonizers. And really, it was because while the pandemic was happening, the natives had so much, their mortality rates were so much higher than those of the colonizers because there were such discrepancies in healthcare and resources due to colonization. So I know I feel like I'm jumping from point to point with no transition here, so just bear with me with that. But I want to talk a little bit about public health and how public health has changed um, since 1918. There's so many things in modern public health that happen that are a direct result of the pandemic in 1918. So before 1918, disease was really seen as a product of unsanitary conditions, crowding, and poor nutrition. That's fair, right? Those, those all are causes of disease, absolutely. So you'll see this is the Five Points neighborhood on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It's very crowded. It's very dirty. It had high rates of disease in the early 20th century. This is Butte, Montana, circa 1912. It's crowded. It's dirty. It had very high rates of disease in the early 20th century. So those are fair. What's not fair is that disease was also seen as this moral failure. So if you got sick, it was because you did something wrong. If you were living in crowded and unsanitary conditions and didn't have enough food or resources to feed your family property, that was your fault. So this is why you're getting sick. And beyond that, the elite classes often blamed the poor for their illnesses. So it was the fault of the poor that the rich ended up getting sick because their failure was resulting in the first three, and they were just afflicting the elites with that. So, ways to control the disease before 1918, sanitation was a huge one. So this is also from New York City, this is a National Archives photo. So it's taken during the pandemic, you'll see these sweepers, they're sweeping up the streets, thinking that uh, they can keep down the dust and therefore keep the germs from swirling. This was very common. It happened in Butte. Uh, they opened fire hydrants in Butte and just let them run down the streets. So probably November of 1918 is the cleanest Butte ever has been or ever will be in the future as well. And isolation. So those that are sick, we just they need to be taken and put aside so they don't get the rest of us sick still practice sometimes, and I think also those are very fair ideas, but it's in practice where they were really unfair, they became unfair. Isolation is practiced for centuries, but usually it was just a matter of the rich people left town because they had the ability to. 
So during the, the years of the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century, the rich people would just leave and go out into the country and seal themselves away so that they wouldn't get sick. The same thing happened in the 19th century with cholera. We just have those with the resources leaving the city to avoid the germs and the sickness that the poor people were bringing upon them. So a historian wrote uh, about this. In the context of an epidemic, public health generally referred to a suite of measures designed to protect those elites from the disease-ridden rabble. So it's not, let's see what we can do to improve the situation, to improve everyone's health. Let's just make sure we don't let the quote unquote disease ridden rattle make the rest of us ill. However, this changed after 1918. And it's because you'll see in a moment Influenza absolutely did not discriminate between social class. So these folks are from Butte because again, it's where I've done most of the work, but you probably find the same examples if we looked here in Glendive and Dawson County. So John O'Meara was um, uh, one of the managers at Centennial Brewing. He was an Irish immigrant. He kind of worked his way up from being a tool boy in one of the mines and had built quite a life for himself and his family. He lived a block away from William Clark and you, and if you've heard of William Clark and how extravagantly rich the man was and how huge and beautiful his home was, you know that John O'Meara lived in a very nice part of town at that time. But he died of influenza in October of 1918, as did his wife and one of his daughters. This is Walter Mueller, his, whoops, see now it wants to go. This is Walter Mueller and his brother Arthur, who were pallbearers at the, the O'Meara Triple Funeral. And both of them died of influenza oops, by December of 1918. And the same woman is Catherine Sullivan Mueller. Um, she was, I believe, Arthur's wife. And she had influenza in the fall of 1918 and recovered, but never really fully got back to feeling like herself. So um, that winter, she moved herself to New York and she took up residence in the brand new Pennsylvania Hotel in Midtown. So it was this beautiful place, but she contracted influenza in the spring wave in 1919 and died in June. So it really didn't matter who you were or where you lived or where you decided to put yourself for the time being like Catherine did. You were still susceptible. So seeing this, Public health and healthcare workers decided we need to do something different. So what happened is you'll see the development of these early warning systems. We determine a baseline for a population's health. So how many people are generally at any given time in this specific population afflicted with whatever illness or condition? Let's find that out. After we find that out, we can implement these monitoring, monitoring and detection systems. So we can tell if this is an abnormal number of people to have the flu right now. If it is, we need to do something right away before we find ourselves in this epidemic or pandemic situation again. The other thing that comes into this is the start of government-funded public health and healthcare systems. It's after 1918 where we see things like the World Health Organization and the CDC and the NHS in Britain start to develop. Because this way we can provide more population-centered health care. We can care for the poor because we have a system that can afford to do it. We're not going to let the poor people not let. We're not going to blame the poor for causing our problems because now we can take care of them before they become a problem. We can also start to track non-communicable health issues like heart disease and rates of different cancers because we have these systems in place. So it goes from being a completely reactionary system based on a lot of prejudice to a proactive system based on equality. Talk about that. It's okay. I can see. So here in Montana, 
though, I'm proud to say that we had a pioneer of these types of systems here. So Dr. William Cogswell was the secretary of the Montana State Board of Health in 1918. He actually put in to join the Army. He thought his efforts would be more at use overseas than they would here in Montana. And the rest of the Board of Health kind of just kept deferring that and decided not to make a decision, which is lucky for us because he was here to kind of lead things during that time. So he's the one that put into place the early warning systems during the pandemic that said, okay, communities in Montana, here's what you need to do. You need to close down all of these businesses. You need to close your schools. You need to do this. Those were his ideas. So I think he was really instrumental in keeping things from getting possibly a lot worse than they could have been otherwise. The other thing that he did afterwards is he created this position of an epidemiologist for the state and really was the forerunner in creating the current practices that are in place in Montana for recording communicable diseases and making sure that those monitoring systems are working. So he wrote after this that our memories of this and other epidemics should not fail. Let us hope that through preparedness and health organization and the education of new generations, we can prevent a repetition of the terrific losses which influenced this class. So he really saw that this was an opportunity to make things better and to improve and to fix the shortcomings that had been around in public health and healthcare for so long. So, and the Communicable Disease and Epidemiology Building for the state of Montana in Helena is, fun fact, named the Cogswell Building. Just a little bit about how healthcare and public health are different because this kind of came about as a result of the pandemic as well. So healthcare is really patient-centered. It's based around what this one physician feels is best for his patient and its treatment at that level. Whereas public health is more at a community level and our control measures and what we put into place are based on what is best for the community as a whole. So there's these two different perspectives who after the pandemic really start to work together. Before the pandemic, you'll see public health departments and boards were staffed primarily with doctors. That isn't really so anymore. There's a specific set of professionals that work in public health who are designed to understand how control measures work on a community level and to work with the healthcare providers to then provide recommendations for patients that may have that disease. So these two systems really work in tandem. And this came about really as a direct result of the pandemic. And if you'll see here, a little shout out locally is Bell Street, down at the end and off on the left is where your current local public health department resides. So this new system at work, influenza is now a reportable disease. Doctors are required to report every case of influenza that they come across to local public health who then reports it to the state. So that's why you see these updates in the news about the current case report. And it's how public health and healthcare alike keep track of what's going on. So we can monitor and see, is this, is this normal? Is this that baseline? Or are we dealing with something different that we need to stop before it starts? So in January of 1919, the View Board of Health discussed how they would handle even one case of influenza to avoid it becoming an epidemic situation. The other thing that I thought was interesting in these particular notes was that the board also discussed, this was after prohibition had gone into effect, they also discussed what they should do with all the confiscated alcohol. And they decided that it was going to be used specifically for disinfecting cases of influenza. So, apparently, if you're in Butte during Prohibition and you want your hands on alcohol, you get influenza. And you get it. In 1933, the influenza virus was identified in a laboratory, which made it possible to develop a vaccine, which, was, which came out in 1944. So you'll see that here it's, it was first used um, on U.S. soldiers during World War II as kind of our first population to get a flu vaccine ever. And 
today, we have an active monitoring system based on testing, treating, and reporting, as I said, and every community in Montana, again, I believe is a direct result of the pandemic, has response plans. They have specific plans in place on how to respond to something of this nature. They have resource reserves that the federal government does. There's lists of emergency facilities to use as hospitals. This is the Finland Hotel in Butte, which was offered up as a hospital during the pandemic. Here in Glendive, any ideas what might have, there was an emergency hospital here, any ideas where it would have been? Think about what buildings could have been useful for that. What's that? No, no, it was not, but it's, it's a good guess because there's room for people. It was Washington School was used as an emergency hospital here in Glendive. So yeah, hotels were often used, schools were a popular choice and still are for emergency <coughs> facilities, anywhere that can handle a large population gathered in one place. So, so Washington School Emergency Hospital, which is part of the reason that for about two months in 1918, there was, school was canceled in Glendive. So the other, the last kind of thing I wanted to touch about is why we really don't remember this. Because I'm going to be honest, so like before I'd heard my family history and then, you know, started working a little bit in public health, I had never really heard about the pandemic in any history class I'd taken and it really wasn't mentioned in a lot of books that I'd read. I didn't hear much about it at all. And I got to thinking, well, why is that? And a lot of people have asked that question. The most you've probably ever heard of it was in the last year because of the centennial. So I think there's a few reasons for this, but they're, they're all just theories. I think one of them might be that people just felt completely out of control and they had no idea what to do with what had, you know, proverbially landed on the doorstep. So there was a nurse from Red Lodge who is at Fort Riley in Kansas, which if we go with that Kansas origin theory, is kind of ground zero for the whole deal. And she wrote, she kind of was writing these reflections on her time in the war and with working with the army. And she wrote about epidemics and disease. The worst one I ever saw in my life was that meningitis. You got the flu and you died. You got meningitis and your head would sit on your seat. From meningitis, we went to a measles epidemic, and from measles, they all got pneumonia, and then pyemia, which is essentially septicemia. But you notice, you got the flu, and you die. And there's nothing else that she has to say about it, because really, there was nothing that medical personnel could do about it. For a long time, they even had no idea what disease they were dealing with. Some of them thought that it was a resurgence of the Black Death of medieval Europe. Some of them thought it was, you know, typhus or something like that. A doctor in Chicago was convinced that everyone was getting sick because they cut out sugar from their diets, from rationing. He was convinced that that was the reason for all this. But they didn't know what was causing it, so they didn't know what to do. And totally out of control. There's nothing you can do about it. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to spend my life, the rest of my life, dwelling on things that I can't control and I can't do anything about, especially if it was kind of a failure of my profession and my career. The other thing is, there's a lot of other things going on during this time to focus on. If I'm a nurse in 1918, one of the things I'm going to focus on is how successful we were in battlefield medicine. There are a lot of advances made. And my profession did a lot of great things overseas. I'm going to remember that. And just the public in general, let's think if we want to remember these photos that you'll see very shortly. Do we want to remember our community, our community's emergency hospital overflowing? with the dead and the dying? Or do we want to remember our streets crowded in celebration of the armistice? Those are really striking images, you know, taken at all at the same time if we compare them with what's going on and what it is that people are going to choose to focus and remember as they move forward. 
and how they're going to tell the narrative of their life and what happened and what they want uh, their descendants to remember. But I think in this, we can take a very important lesson in not forgetting because what happened was so important and has made so many lasting impacts that I think it's important that we remember those things that may have seemed at the time of failure something completely out of our control. Finally, I want to talk about the survivors, though, because there's so many of them. My grandfather, some of you, I don't know, may be here because you heard a story somewhere in your family history about someone who suffered from this disease and maybe survived or maybe didn't. Um, and what I found that was really interesting is when I was going through local records, I saw a very familiar name in one of them. Um, my best friend growing up in Idaho, um, I didn't think about it until I saw death certificates with that last name on it. And then I remembered she had family here during that time. So my best friend growing up also lost a great grandparent to influenza in 1918 here in Dawson County. Her great grandmother and what would have been um, her aunt died of influenza in 1918. So let's think back. Uh, I introduced you to uh, Chris Vizhnius and um, Spira Vucinich, who over the last four years have come to feel like part of my family. But I want to introduce you to a couple of other people that I've grown very fond of. This is Norman Business. His parents died in 1918, as you'll remember. He moved a block over and lived with his uncle in Butte after his parents both died of influenza. This was taken from the Butte High School yearbook in about 1931, kind of a handsome fellow. He went on and went to the School of Mines, uh, now Montana Tech in Butte, and then went to work for the American Smiting and Refelting, uh, American Smelting and Refining Company. Um, he was a regional manager in Wallace, Idaho, and then he moved down to Arizona where he was the manager of North American operations and eventually worked his way up to vice president of the entire company at their headquarters in New York. So, quite a legacy left for this young man. And then, this is Wayne Vucinich. His parents, remember, also both passed away of influenza. He was moved, he moved back to Serbia with relatives, he and his siblings did. When he was about 15, he had the opportunity to move to Los Angeles and live with his grandfather, and he chose to do so. And he taught himself how to speak English and to read and to write English. He went to Cal Berkeley and got degrees in um, Eastern and Slavic history and languages. He worked for the government in Balkan affairs, and then he became a professor at Stanford, where he was for many, many years. And I read that his students called him Uncle Wayne, and he was very well loved on campus. And they even have a fellowship in their Slavic languages and history department named after him. So again, quite a legacy left over after what could have been a very, very tragic life. So. Unfortunately, I wish I had some more of because I'm sure they're out there. Those great stories that came from Dawson County that grew up out of this potentially tragic episode in family histories, but just ended up not becoming that for whatever reason. So that's what I want to leave us with, is just these stories of hope and resilience that grew out of what was otherwise a terrible tragedy. and. Thank you for coming, and I'd, answer, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions you have. I've been working on this project for about five years, and I could talk about it all day, but I promise that I won't, and if you don't want to stick around while others ask questions, I completely understand, but thank you all so much for coming out tonight, and um, yeah, I'll take any questions.